Hello and welcome to Bite Size MRCP, a manageable way to digest the things that you need to know for your MRCP exam. We are two junior doctors based in the UK who have passed all three parts of the MRCP within the last five years and want to help you do the same. We are not associated with any MRCP examination organizations and the materials covered are by no means an exhaustive list of what can come up in your exam and indeed are not intended to be used as medical advice. Please refer to your College of Entry or your friendly supervisor for further questions regarding the exam and syllabus. If you like the sound of what you hear today and would like to join us for more bite size revision, give us a thumbs up and press the subscribe button. Now, without further ado, let's get into today's topic. Which is on systemic lupus erythematosus under the section of rheumatology. To start with, we're going to go over the classification of lupus. Uh, lupus is loosely used very, uh, quite frequently uh, to describe uh, what we know as SLE, um, which is the systemic lupus erythematosus. However, there are three other subtypes um, uh, that technically comes under this uh, disease, and uh, those are subacute, subacute cutaneous lupus, discoid lupus, and also drug-induced lupus. For the purpose of uh, this video, we are going to be covering the systemic lupus erythematosus or the uh, SLE, uh, which is a type that frequently people use um, um, by just saying lupus. So what is systemic lupus erythematosus? It's an autoimmune systemic inflammatory connective tissue disease uh, due to production of autoantibodies and complement deposition. It is a multi-system. Uh, it, it's a multi-systemic disease with multi-systemic manifestation, including skin, uh, joints, and other organs that we will be discussing shortly. In terms of its epidemiology, it uh, affects uh, females far more commonly than males, with a ratio of about 10 to 1, and it is uh, approximately 3 to 4 times uh, more common in non-Caucasians compared to Caucasians. Um, and it has a relatively a good uh, survival with more than 90% um, um, of at 10 years. In terms of clinical features of it, this was one of the um, relatively an older American College of Rheumatologists um, uh, diagnostic criteria for lupus. However, uh, it is a still a really good mnemonic uh, to help you guys at your stage uh, with your membership exams. Uh, and the mnemonic is MD Brain um, Soap. So as you can see on the board, we have got M for Malar rash, which is the classic butterfly uh, rash that comes one with um, SLE. You've got discoid rash, which is the other rash that can sometimes present um, um, as a um, SLE. Be careful to not to mix this with discoid lupus, because as we discussed, that's another entity on its own. You can have blood disorders, and those are a variety of um, conditions such as pancytopenias or um, anemias, uh, such as hemolytic anemia. Uh, you can have renal dysfunction, and that is in the case of proteinuria or glomerulonephritis. You very frequently have a positive ANA. Uh, you can have other immunologic phenomenon, and that is in the way of uh, autoantibodies, um, such as anti-DSDNA, um, anti-Smith, and antiphospholipid. These are more specific than your ANA uh, for the diagnosis of SLE. It can present with neurologic um, abnormalities, uh, such as seizures or acute psychosis. Uh, it can affect, as we discussed, multiple organs and uh, multiple systems, so you can get uh, serocytis as a result of this, um, such as pleurisy, pericardial effusion, and pericarditis. 
you can have oral or nasal or, um, ulcerations. Uh, you can have arthralgia, which is a type of non-erosive arthralgia. And then finally, you uh, frequently do get photosensitivity with this. Uh, and the rash that um, is frequently described with um, SLE is, the, uh, is, is, is a photosensitive rash. Okay, so this is the updated 2019 um, criteria that has been uh, jointly used by European League Against Rheumatism and American College of Rheumatology. And really, it's, it, it, it's still quite similar to the previous guidelines. However, the important thing to note is that um, in order, you know, for you to progress to be diagnosed with lupus, you really need to be having that positive ANA. And if you don't have a positive ANA, you pretty much cannot be having lupus as in systemic lupus erythematosus. Um, so it's quite important for you guys to know this because um, in a, a question, if they come and tell you um, a system, uh, um, a multi multi-systemic disease um, with various signs and symptoms, but they give you a negative ANA, then you can pretty much exclude um, the possibility of SLE as an option in there. In terms of the other features that can be presented clinically with lupus, uh, this can be quite helpful in an, um, in your station five in PACES exam. Um, so um, fatigue is the probably the commonest presenting uh, complaint with patients uh, with lupus. Um, you can have uh, uh, weight loss, fever, uh, it's one of the most important causes to exclude in pyrexia of, on, of um, unknown origin. Uh, you can have lymphadenopathy, especially this is prior to having treatment um, um, or any uh, immunomodulatory drugs. Uh, and you can also have Raynaud's, uh, which is a condition that will be covered in uh, another lecture later on. Uh, but just to briefly go over it, it's basically a condition where uh, your digits um, get triphasic uh, color changes um, from um, white to blue to red uh, when they have exposure to cold. You can have uh, Jacquard's arthropathy, which is uh, your essentially um, quite an extensive um, arthropathy that is quite classically seen with lupus. Uh, you can have non-erosive reversible deformative um, um, arthropathy due to uh, capsular laxity uh, and it's this is really quite important because this is a big difference between uh, somebody who uh, is presenting with perhaps similar pain or arthralgia as you would uh, you know you would be seeing in other autoimmune ar um, arthritis such as rheumatoid arthritis however this uh, the um, arthritis sec in secondary to lupus, it is going to be a reversible form uh, once the lupus is under control. They can present with uh, hypertension, weight loss, non-scarring alopecia, um, difficulty concentrate, uh, concentrating, and also a condition called Lip, uh, lipman sachs endocarditis, uh, which is uh, due to uh, hypercoagul hypercoagulability um, of the patient, uh, which is quite pathognomonic of uh, lupus. That's one of your causes of a culture negative endocarditis. So in a clinical vignette, in your multiple choice questions, if they describe somebody who has all the signs and symptoms of endocarditis, however, the block cultures that has been done is repeatedly coming back as negative, it certainly would be worse to think about your uh, uh, autoimmune causes such as lupus uh, and the possibility of it being a case of Lipman Sachs endocarditis. So this is the uh, sort of the classic malar or butterfly rash that um, I mentioned earlier. Um, and this is very frequently seen on the uh, cheeks and the uh, bridge of the nose. So in terms of the investigation that you would want to do for somebody who is a possibility of uh, lupus, uh, remember really we are going to go 
through the criteria that we discussed earlier. So um, you would be checking for your uh, for full blood count uh, to look for any evidence of anemia, neutropenia, lymphopenia, or thrombocytopenia. You'll be looking at renal function, which is very important. Um, because we will discuss this later. However, uh, lupus very frequently can affect your kidneys and you can get um, various forms of a kidney injury from proteinuria all the way to an AKI and CKD. Uh, you would be looking for a direct anti-globulin or DAP test um, to basically investigate the possibility of an autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Uh, ESR and CRP, they can be both elevated in groupers. However, your ESR is far more increased compared to your CRP in the case of um, systemic lupus um, erythematosus. Uh, and really, you would be wanting to do your antibody panels as soon as possible. And that's very importantly, your anti-nuclear antibody or your ANA. Uh, because remember, if your ANA is um, not positive, you pretty much can exclude uh, lupus uh, or systemic lupus erythematosus rather uh, based on the updated ULAR ACR, um, ACR criteria. You'll be looking at anti-DSDNA, anti-SMITH, anti-RO, anti-LA, anti-phospholipid and then finally anti-URMP if you're thinking about the case of mixed connective tissue disease. And your uh, complement level would be another important uh, um, factor to consider. Remember, this is a disease due to complement deposition. So, in terms of the investigations, um, the other thing that you really want to do is um, really trying to get the diagnosis sooner than later. And this is where your uh, tissue biopsy, especially if they have uh, renal involvement, will be uh, coming handy. It's really quite important for you to be, uh, to be familiar with the classification of glomerulonephritis that can present secondary to lupus. Uh, this is broadly um, divided into six categories um, and we're going, to um, we're going to cover all of them in more details. So in your category one, which is the stage one, if you like, uh, you get minimal change disease. And really, the patient is really quite a uh, asymptomatic at this stage. However, if you do end up doing a kidney biopsy, what well, you will see, it will be a, a mesangial immune deposits. Your category two, um, it's your mesangial proliferative. Uh, which is when you get microscopic hematuria plus minus proteinuria and you rarely have hypertension with it. And if you do a biopsy um, and you look at the specimen under histology, you will be looking at uh, mesangial hypercellularity. Category three is your focal disease, uh, which is um, frequently presents with hematuria and proteinuria, you could or you could not have hypertension with this. And importantly, in your histology, you'll have less than 50% of glomeruli being affected, um, and you also will get a segmental uh, a wire looping. In category four, which is a, uh, your diffuse type, you will have hematuria, you will have proteinuria, and a patient frequently presents with a nephritic syndrome. Therefore, hypertension is quite common and you'll have low complements and high DSDNA. It's very important to know that this is the most common type of lupus nephritis that you can get. Therefore, in a question in your part two exam in particular, if they describe a patient who has all the signs and symptoms of uh, SLE and ends up going on a biopsy, and if they ask you what is the most likely uh, histological finding uh, to uh, uh, find, it will be your type 4 or diffuse pattern. In terms of the histology of it, you will have more than 50% uh, of your glomeruli being affected and you will have extensive deposition uh, throughout your uh, basal membrane. Uh, in, as for your category 5 or stage 5, it's um, the membranous disease and you will have extensive proteinuria with minimal hematuria. 
so this is when the patient are uh, using um, um, quite a lot of protein in their urine and free, uh, importantly you will have um, granular uh, um, or global um, or segmental uh, subepithelium immune deposition um, and your uh, cat final category or category six is your advanced sclerosing, uh, which is very frequently seen as a case of CKD in patients. And uh, by that point, you would unfortunately have about uh, more than 90% of your glomeruli to be sclerosed. So in terms of management of uh, systemic lupus um, erythematosus, uh, really like um, any other medical condition, you would start with conservative measures. Uh, these include uh, first and foremost um, sunscreen uh, with high SPF uh, in order to photo, uh, photo protect. Um, uh, followed by really managing comorbidities um, in patients, in particular uh, managing the cardiovascular health, and that is to encourage them to stop smoking if they are a current smoker, uh, manage their uh, high cholesterol, and also um, maintain a healthy BMI. Um, Fatigue is one of the commonest uh, presenting symptoms that patients present and experience throughout their uh, course of their illness um, and therefore it's very important to actually pair up with other members of the uh, MDT uh, such as psychologists and physiotherapists who are normally a, a great source of uh, wisdom uh, for these patients. Uh, it's very important to encourage them to uh, get uh, vaccinations uh, if they are eligible uh, for those um, and that's uh, in order to uh, prevent infection uh, especially given their state of um, immunosuppression uh, which a lot of them uh, would be on uh, and equally important would be the management of osteoporosis uh, and osteoporosis uh, uh, prophylaxis um, especially um, if you're considering courses of uh, steroid um, for instance um, and finally remember most of your patients who are going to be suffering from uh, SLE are going to be uh, childbearing women uh, therefore it's very important to have appropriate um, um, contraception uh, for these uh, because if they uh, did become pregnant uh, on an immunosuppressant, um, a large majority of those are um, uh, teratogenic um, and certainly that's not something that you would want your uh, um, patient to be on during their pregnancy. In terms of the medical management of um, SLE, uh, the first line recommendation is hydroxychloroquine. Uh, which is a drug that has been in the market for quite some time and um, you basically the key thing especially for an um, MRCP exam uh, would be to know that uh, patients who have been on this drug for five years or more will need to have annual uh, ocular screening. Uh, you could use corticosteroids uh, which normally respond really well um, to uh, disease and especially the flare-ups of SLE. Um, I'm sure you know that uh, we don't really um, want patients to be on long-term um, courses of steroids due to their side effects. Uh, however, if uh, a patient is having a flare-up of their existing disease, very frequently in practice they end up getting uh, bridged with steroids. Uh, other drugs that are frequently used are methotrexate, loflunomide and azotyoprine. And really the um, uh, last few options are for your uh, severe um, cases of SLE that are not responding to uh, the um, initial management that we, all, uh, we have already discussed. And these include mycophenolate, rituximab, which is very important for you to know it is a, a SCD20 blocker, uh, belilumab, um, and also um, IVIG and plasmapheresis. Okay, let's do some questions now. Uh, question one is what is the most prevalent class of lupus nephritis? Uh, A1, B2, C3, D4, E5. 
and if you guys remember correctly the most common uh, class of lupus nephritis is class 4 therefore option d would be correct question 2 is which combination of autoantibodies are most indicative of diagnosis of systemic lupus erythematosus if present a ana urmp b ana anti rho anti la c ana dsdna anti rho d dsdna rheumatoid factor e anti rho anti la so if you guys remember we talked about uh, really the necessity of having ANA um, with, the, uh, with the updated guideline in order to be able to um, uh, diagnose anyone with lupus. And if you also remember, I did talk about uh, DSDNA and um, anti uh, rho and la to be quite specific uh, for lupus. Therefore, your option C, which talks about really all of them, would be the most appropriate in here. Question three, a 30 year old woman is newly diagnosed with SLE. She's planning a pregnancy soon. Her disease activity is currently stable aside from an intermittent malar rash when she spends a moderate amount of time at, um, outdoors. Which of the following drugs is most suitable for her? So this is basically trying to test your um prescribing safety with uh, cases of pregnancy and if you remember we talked about hydroxychloroquine uh, to be the first line and, and, it, and, and it is actually a safe drug to be continued during pregnancy uh, in the cases of lupus um, but as a recall uh, you would remember that uh, anyone who has been on hydroxychloroquine for five years or more will need to have annual uh, annual um, uh, ocular screening um, according to the UK um, standards. Thanks for listening to this episode of Bite Sized MRCP. If you like the sound of what you hear today, give us a thumbs up and hit the like and subscribe button below to make sure that you don't miss out on any of our future episodes. Let us know in the comments which topic you would like us to hear in the future. See you in the next episode.